Hello YouTube, Dave here again. Today we're going to be looking at the Diaspora Strain. This is the first part of the three-part Signal of Screams Adventure Path. Uh, this is for characters of 7th level, uh, and they will reach 8th and then 9th level by the adventure's conclusion. Uh, and it's the beginning of the third adventure path overall for the Starfinder role-playing game. It's also the first adventure path to begin uh, with characters higher than 1st level. And uh, this is actually a pretty good follow-up to the Aeon Throne Adventure Path if you were running that one and looking for something to do afterwards. However, it's not actually required. There's very little in the way of references or stuff like that um, to the previous Adventure Path. So you can do this with your homebrew characters or you can even just start up with brand new characters um, for the purposes of running this adventure. What's sort of unique about this adventure is that it's sort of a supernatural slash psychological horror based adventure. Now I want to make this review as spoiler free as possible, mainly because I don't want to ruin um, sort of the twists or some, some of the events that occur uh, in this adventure for anyone who may be, who may be running it or may be uh, playing in it. But I still want to give my thoughts on the adventure overall. Uh, so the adventure takes place at this new uh, luxury resort known as Elysium, which is uh, opening up in a uh, location known as the uh, the Diaspora in the core in the uh, the Pact World system. So the the Diaspora is basically like an asteroid belt. Uh, the the resort itself is is owned by a company known as Paradise Resorts, and they're sort of known for having high luxury resorts in unconventional places. Uh, in addition to the characters being there, uh, there's also a whole other set of guests, including a professional video gamer. Uh, that's actually a Yoski, so one of the little mouse people. Uh, you have a journalist that's there, sort of a reviewer for like travel uh, destinations and things along those lines. Uh, you have an Android uh, researcher along with their personal attendant and an entire sports team by the name of the Absalom Buzzblades. Uh, so they are the championship winning team for the sport of Brutaris, uh, which is sort of like a gladiatorial sport that seems like a combination based on how it's described, almost like a combination of rugby with like American gladiator style obstacles. Uh, but it seems kind of interesting. So all of the guests are invited for the purposes of testing out the facilities, providing their thoughts on what the facilities are like, as well as to test out this brand new virtual concierge application known as the Keys to Elysium. Uh, they are greeted by a pretty jovial looking halfling by the name of Philip Kulsner, uh, and they also have like a medical staff and a security staff and, you know, uh, just, but it, overall it's sort of um, lightly staffed because there's only a handful of guests versus what the resort is actually capable of. This is, again, sort of a PR thing to test out uh, these, new, uh, these new facilities, these new features, and things like that. Uh, so, the adventure actually opens up with a uh, potential spaceship battle, star battle, uh, starship battle, I should say. Um, now, the, uh, the battle itself is actually optional, uh, unlike some of the other ones, which seem to happen um, the, uh, as like a planned encounter. Uh, the characters have the chance to either intervene or to allow the uh, security forces of uh, Elysium to handle it. But, um, depending on how they go about that, it may change some of the role-playing situations that occur uh, throughout the adventure. Uh, the first few days stay at the resort are pretty basically mundane and this is a good opportunity to allow the player characters uh, some serious role-playing interactions and uh, I think that that's going to be important for reasons I'll get into uh, momentarily. However, things start going awry as after you know three or four days uh, at this, I think it's a 10-day stay, um, the characters as well as the NPCs start to suffer from strange hallucinations. They'll see things that, you know, sort of aren't there. It starts off sort of benign, it's just like movement out of the corner of their eyes where there's nothing there, but eventually it leads to actual full-on um, hallucinations where they're like experiencing things that aren't actually necessarily real. Uh, you know, they have um, it's some, you know, they start off sort of, again, sort of simple and mundane, but they can reach a point where they actually start to affect the characters mentally and physically, causing uh, actual damage. And, um, like, one of the ones that I always kind of liked, that I thought was kind of interesting, and this is the only one that I'm going to spoil, um, but the, uh, the, the character, if one of the characters is going into, like, this hot tub, 
um, they, you know, end up, if they fail their saving throw uh, before they step into it, they basically step into boiling hot water, causing, you know, quite a bit of pain and, again, damage. Um, when the characters, if they investigate it, they find that, you know, the, therm the temperature controls were not faulty, they weren't um, hacked or anything like that, then that the character themselves actually, you know, increase the temperature to a boiling point, which is something that they don't recall doing, but it's, it's obvious if they go back and look at the footage. Uh, some of the other uh, potential hallucinations that they may have deal damage that's not necessarily real. So they take it off their stamina points, and stamina damage is, uh, remains, because that's sort of like your ability to resist and things like that. Um, it's not like actual hit points, but they may perceive that they've taken hit point damage until this hallucination ends, at which point their hit points would go back up to their normal amount, but they would still retain any stamina damage that they've taken. Uh, in addition to that, they also have to fight off a form of corruption that starts taking over everyone. Uh, it starts off by having situations where individuals may engage in like a uh, in a fight or something like that, or one of the security guards may, in, in an attempt to break up an altercation, use excessive force, and instead of being sort of appalled by the fact that they use such excessive force, you see that they actually like the fact that they were so brutal. And uh, so as time goes on, all of the guests start to succumb to these um, these corruptions. Um, and what's interesting is that the player characters themselves can also, uh, are also being affected by this. So, uh, the corruptions are basically each day they have to make a saving throw, and if they fail, they gain, um, one of these corruptions. And when they gain a corruption, they can either, um, so they, they get a negative, like a penalty that comes with it, but if they want, they can actually choose to gain a gift to come with it. Uh, and that's sort of the interesting thing. So the gift is some sort of bonus um, that they can get. However, if they gain too many of these bonuses, if they accept too many of these gifts, or if they have too many of these um, corruptions in the first place, then they basically go full-on insane and become NPCs under the Dungeon Master's control, or the Game Master's control, and uh, basically would start just attacking everyone around them. And that's sort of what happens, is the guests start to become more and more unhinged. They start to uh, physically change. Their eyes may become sunken or dark, or they, you know, they may, like, almost like blackened eyes, they become, like, gaunt. They, there's, they may begin physically harming themselves um, just to feel pain sort of thing. And it almost has sort of, um, honestly, the, the, the way that the adventure and the corruptions and stuff are written, uh, it kind of almost gives me, like, a Hellraiser vibe. You just kind of get, like, you know, the idea that what's causing this almost seems like a centibite in nature. So it'd be pretty cool if that's the way that uh, that that ends up going down. Anyway, it's up to the player characters to, with the assistance of this android researcher, to find out what's causing this madness to occur and hopefully fight it off themselves long enough to discover the source and make their escape. Now, the the source is, the, the clues to the source can be found with deeper within the asteroid that this um, resort is built on and sort of discovering its past and what we had before as far as like what existed, what types of facilities existed before the luxury resort was, was built on there. And, uh, and that's basically how the, the first part of the adventure goes. Uh, so, overall, and again, I don't want to spoil anything just because uh, I think that this is a really cool adventure, but one of the biggest things about it are like the twists and turns and things like that that you can get into. So overall, um, I actually really, really like this adventure, but I will say that where it is a like a, a psychological or supernatural horror adventure, it is going to have niche appeal. So for individuals who aren't interested or aren't a big fan of like horror in their role-playing games, unfortunately this is probably not going to be the product for you. Uh, I would recommend picking it up and at least trying it out to see if maybe this is presented in a way that you may find enjoyable. Um, but I can, I can see this having niche appeal. That said, I think that that's actually one of the strengths of these shorter adventure paths where they're only three chapters long. 
that you can experiment and you can sort of introduce these subgenres into the science fantasy role playing game that they've set up here and i think that that's actually you know a really good use of these of these adventure paths so uh, i would like to see maybe other ones sort of cross over as well uh, other types of genres you know that they can they could possibly think of uh, I think would be an absolutely great use of these uh, of these products. Um, like always, there's useful information beyond just the adventure. Uh, this book actually has a bunch of uh, guidelines and information for running horror-based adventures, and as well as like the the manifestations, the corruptions, all that stuff. Uh, but it goes into like all kinds of different advice for various types of horror campaigns. So it doesn't necessarily have to be just like the psychological or supernatural horror of this adventure but it gives you advice for like action horror cosmic horror um and uh whoops uh, and uh, body horror which is like a cycle like a physiological thing which is again really interesting sort of concepts uh it gives you know again explanations as to why you would maybe want to run a horror game what not to include uh just lots of great advice for running horror themed campaigns so if you're interested in running a horror-based adventure, but you've never done it before, you don't know how the best to best go about it. This actually has some pretty decent information in there as well. Uh, you also have some like a player's options. You have some feats as well as a couple of spells that you can introduce uh, to your Starfinder game. Uh, Paranormal Investigator, which is a brand new theme that you can use, as well as just a host of creatures, uh, some of which appear in the adventure, others not necessarily. But again, just a cool host of creatures to have for your campaigns if you want to, you know, run Starfinder games. And like every Adventure Path uh, book that's come out, that I, at least that I have, uh, each one has on the last page um, just like a write-up of a planet that you can use if you want sort of um, an idea or a new location to investigate. Uh, so overall, I think that this is actually a really cool uh, adventure. There are some things that I would recommend um, for anyone who does want to run it. The biggest thing is really spend time role playing out the social interactions between the player characters and the guests. I think it's kind of important that that's established because again a big part of like the the elements of horror is, you know, what happens when your um your acquaintances or even your friends if they develop sort of like an actual level of friendship uh, become so corrupted that the characters have no choice but to basically engage in a fight with them and to put them down. Um, this is something that can be much more impactful if they have plenty of time to actually develop these sort of relationships with them. And um, so that's something that I would highly, highly recommend is role playing out the characters. So that's something that if you're not the greatest at role playing, um, it, this is an opportunity where you haven't had a lot of experience as a dungeon, as a game master. Um, role-playing situations out, then this would be a good one to probably start off with. It gives uh, descriptions of each of the characters or NPCs that are there in the book, as well as some of the, like, their personality traits and characteristics, so you can sort of use that uh, as an example. Um, and I would also suggest the characters befriending the staff as well. Um, after all, this is a luxury resort, so, you know, the staff would want to be friendly and approachable and everything like that. So I highly recommend that that's you know, something that you spend even an entire session on uh, just for the first few days, just establishing that uh, that friendship before or those connections before moving into the more serious and uh, the darker parts of the adventure itself. Uh, the adventure is very well written, uh, and I, you know, and I've come to expect that I think from all of these Starfinder adventure paths. Each of the ones that I've looked through so far have been really, really well done, and this is certainly no exception. Uh, I definitely respect Paizo for going out and releasing something that is sort of a niche, uh, will have niche appeal. Uh, but I'm glad that they did so because, again, I think that this is an excellent resource to have for this type of game. And with science fiction or science fantasy or whatever you want to call it, in general, I think that there's a lot of good uses of horror in that system. Like I think it feels like a role-playing system or role-playing setting where horror just seems like it would really naturally 
be able to be integrated uh, into it. If you look at a lot of like the science fiction and horror movies that are out there, um, a lot of those are great fodder for like the role-playing games like Starfinder. So I appreciate that they did that. Uh, I also like the fact that these are shorter adventure paths so that overall it gives your players different things to do. Like for example having a large uh, adventure path that takes the characters all the way from 1st to 20th level can be great but at the same time, your characters are sort of stuck on that one story throughout the entire progression of their, their characters, and that can kind of wear on them. Uh, whereas having the shorter paths, even if you string them together, for example, uh, the Diaspora Strain can be run directly after the Rune Drive Gambit, which was the uh, conclusion to the uh, Aeon Throne adventure. But they're two very different adventures, and it just feels like another thing that the characters would be doing, as opposed to like this one overarching storyline that just dominates their entire uh, careers, sort of, so to speak. So uh, again, I really like these, and these Adventure Path books overall have been just again really, really well done with all the information that's in them, including um, like new player character options, new monsters, new worlds to explore. Um, I really can't say enough good stuff about this. Uh, so if you're interested in trying out a horror-based adventure in your Starfinder game, then I can't recommend this enough. Even if you don't run the adventure that's in here, there's still some good information that you can use to create your own horror adventure if that's what you want to do. And I would recommend it for, for that. And you can obviously cherry pick ideas from the adventure itself if you don't want to run uh, the, the full adventure. But I think the full adventure is certainly worth running. And again, I, I personally recommend it. And I'm looking forward to getting a chance to run it once I conclude my Aeon Throne campaign that I'm currently just starting. Anyway, uh, let me know in the comments below what you guys think of the adventure if you run it. Uh, if you've played it, try to avoid spoilers as much as possible, uh, just for those that haven't. And again, I want to thank uh, Paizo Publishing for sending this to me. Uh, so even though that they sent this adventure to me, uh, they had no input on my you know, opinions of the adventure, and I am giving this an honest review. I think that that's really important. So they sent it to me, but they're not sponsoring the channel, they're not paying me for the review. And uh, again, these are my own honest opinions. I, like I said, I think this is a great adventure, but it is going to have a niche market that it's going to appeal to. If you're not into horror, then unfortunately this is probably not going to be the product for you. But for those that are interested, uh, or those that want to try something new, then this is a great way to go. Anyway, thank you guys very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed, and I will see you next time. Take care.